Hello and welcome to Mr. Tompkins EdTech and a brand new series of videos aimed at helping you prepare for your GCSE mathematics exams. In this series I'll be giving a complete walkthrough of the GCSE mathematics practice papers to help you prepare for your exams this summer. Now there are not so many of these and you don't want to squander them so make sure you try the paper yourself first before you look at these solutions. This particular video is AQA New Practice Set 3 Foundation Paper 1 Non-Calculator. Check the front cover of your paper to make sure it's the same one. If it's not, have a look through the playlist linked above which includes all the GCSE mass video walkthroughs I've recorded so far. I'm busy recording all of the GCSE uh, practice papers, so if the one you're looking for isn't there already, why not subscribe by clicking the big red button below and check back in a few days. Don't forget to click on the bell so that you'll get a notification when I upload the next paper. I'll put timestamps in the description below so you can choose to watch the whole thing through or you can click on the timestamp and jump to the particular question you need help with. If you have a question, check the comments below as someone else might have already asked the same thing. If it's a new question, Leave it in the comments and I will try and answer all of them as soon as I can. Don't forget to mention which question on the paper you're referring to and try and be as specific as possible. Finally, if this video helps you with your revision, please give it a thumbs up. It will really help me out and why not share the link with your friends because they might need a helping hand too. Okay, let's get into it. Question one, what is nine tenths as a percentage? Now, percentages are just fractions over 100. So if I can take my 9 tenths and change it so it's a fraction over 100 rather than as a fraction over 10, I should be able to know what the percentage is. So 10 goes into 100 10 times. So multiplying top and bottom by 10, I'm going to get 9 tenths is the same thing as 90 over 100. And 90 over 100 is the same thing as 90% or 90 per 100. Okay, so it's that one there, isn't it? Question two. Which one of these numbers is a multiple of 12? Circle your answer. Okay, so do you know your 12 times table? 1 12s, 12s, 2 12s, 24, 3 12s, 36, 4 12s are 48, 5 12s are 60, 6 12s are 72. What is the name? given to the most frequent item in a list. Circle your answer. Is it the mean, the median, the mode, or the range? Uh, well, mode means most, median is middle, and mean is where you add them all together and divide by how many you got, so it's that one, mode. Question four, convert 2.5 meters into centimeters. Well, you should know that one meter is 100 centimeters. Uh, so, 2.5 meters is going to be 2.5 times 100, which is 250 centimeters, isn't it? It's that one there. Question 5. Work out 7,152 plus 876 minus 139. Okay, so I'm going to work from left to right here. Uh, add those two together first and then I'll subtract off the 139. Seems like a reasonable way of going about it. Uh, so, should we do this by column addition? 1752876 plus. Okay, starting from the right hand side, 2 plus 6 is 8, 5 plus 7 is 12, so that's 2 carry 1. Uh, 1 plus 8 plus 1 is 0, so it's 0 carry 1. 7 and 1 is 8, 8,076. Now we can take off the 139. What does that give us? Uh, 8 subtract 9, can't do that, so I need to borrow one, don't I, from here. That becomes 1, that becomes 18. 18 subtract 9 is 9. 1 subtract 3, can't do that either. I've got to do lots of borrowing here. Uh, Going to borrow... Well, I can't borrow from 0, so I'm going to have to borrow one from 8, so it becomes 7, that becomes 10, and then I'm going to have to borrow one from the 10, so that becomes 9, and this becomes 11. 11 subtract 3, 
horrible borrowing, eight. And then nine subtract one is eight, and seven subtract zero is seven. Seven, eight, eight, nine. Question six. The first part of a show starts at 7.45 p.m. It lasts 35 minutes. What times does the first part end? Okay, so we need to add on 35 minutes to 7.45. Uh, now, if you're in an exam room, you can often use the clock to help you. Uh, there'll always be a clock somewhere in the room. So perhaps you can use that as a visual aid to count on. Uh, but if we're at 7.45... Uh, it's a long hand on, on there already, so it's going to be 15 minutes to take us back up to the top, and we've still got another 20 minutes to add, so it's going to end up going around to 20 past, isn't it? So it's going to be 8.20 p.m. when it ends. After the first part, there is a 20-minute break. The second part lasts 45 minutes. What time does the second part end? Okay, so we're now at 8.20. So the long hand is down here, isn't it, at 20? Uh, so, uh, there's a 20 minute break, so that will take us up to 8.40, won't it? And then I've got another 45 minutes to add on to that. Well, another 20 minutes will take me up to nine o'clock. Uh, and then how much more have I got to add on after that? Another 25 minutes. So that's going to take me all the way around to, back around to there, 25, isn't it? Okay, so it's going to go on until 9.25. 9.25 p.m. Question seven. A game is played with a fair spinner. Now, fair in probability questions means that each of those three outcomes are equally as likely. So you're just as likely to get an 8, a 17 as you are a 32. Now it says player one spins the spinner twice. The player adds the two numbers together to get the scores. Complete the table to show the possible scores. So we've got the possibility space here to fill out. So we're going to be adding the two scores together and putting their combined scores in the possibility space. So let's take this one here for instance. That is in the eight column and the 8 row and 8 plus 8 is 16. So I'm going to write 16 in that box there. Okay, next one along, 8 plus 17, that gives me 25. 8 plus 32 is 40. 17 and 8 gives me 25. 17 and 17 is 34. 17 and 32 is 49. 32 and 8 is 40. 32 and 17 is 49, and, and 32 and 32 is 64. Right, 7b says, work out the probability that a score is a square number. Okay, now probability is defined to be, probability is equal to successful outcomes divided by total outcomes. Now, in our possibility space, the total outcomes is the number of answers there are all together. I've got three rows of three here. So that is nine, isn't it? So we've got nine outcomes that are possible. Now, how many of those are square numbers? Well, the squares are the numbers. One times one is one. Two times two is four. Three threes are nine. Four fours are 16. Five fives are 25. Six sixes are 36. Seven sevens are 49 and eight eights are 64. Uh, so we can see from our diagram that 16 is a square, 25 is a square, 25 is a square, 49 is a square, 49 is a square and 64 is a square. So altogether that's one, two, three, four, five, six numbers in the grid that are square numbers. So if I pick one at random then I've got six chances, six successful outcomes out of a total of nine outcomes. So the probability is going to be six ninths. Now, six ninths can be cancelled down, but uh, you never get any extra credit for doing that in probability questions. So, just as good to leave it as it is. Question eight. Here is information about five basketball games. We can see that from the key up here, uh, away wins are grey and home wins are black. Okay, so here are the five teams. Bristol, Leeds, Manchester, Plymouth, Surrey. 
Uh, and the black parts of the bar, we said are that home wins and the grey ones are away wins. So which team has the most home wins is going to be the team which has got the biggest black bar. Uh, now you can see on the black bars here, we have, how can I write this in the colour it might be seen? Uh, this one is seven, isn't it? Uh, this one is a height four, this one is a height eight, and this one is a height five, and this one is of height four. So the biggest one there is the Manchester one, isn't it? So which team has the most home wins? It is Manchester. Part B says, which two teams have the same number of away wins? Okay, now the away wins with the grey ones are a little bit harder to read off this scale because they don't all start in the same place. All the black bars started on the zero line, so it's really easy to compare them. Uh, to compare the other ones, uh, we really need to kind of count from up here, look where they start to down here where they finish and work out the distance between the two. So this first one starts at 30, well it starts at 7 doesn't it, it goes up to 13. So that's a difference of 6, 13 take away 7 is 6. Uh, the lead grey bar goes from 4 up to 9, 9 take away 4 is 5. Uh, Manchester goes from 8 up to 12, 12 subtract 8 is 4. Uh, Plymouth goes from 5 up to 11, 11 subtract 5 is 6, and Surrey, well that's just got a height of 1 isn't it? So which two teams have the same number of home wins? It's going to be that one there and that one there, they're the two sixes aren't they? So Bristol and Plymouth. So which two teams have the same number of away wins? Bristol and Plymouth. Now, HC says, how many more home wins than away wins were there all together? How many more home wins than away wins were there all together? So we need to know the number of home wins. We need to number, know the number of away wins. And then we need to take one away from the other to see what the difference is. Okay, so we could do that up on the diagram up here. You don't have to work down by the question. You can work anywhere on the question. And often it's easier to work up by the diagram because all the information is right in front of you. Uh, so the number of home wins is going to be all the black bars added together, isn't it? So that's 7 plus 4 plus 8. Oh, would help if I could put it so you could see it. 8 plus 5 plus 4, which adds up to... I think I'm going off the top of the screen again, aren't I? Uh, which adds up to 7 plus 4 is 11, plus 9 is 19, plus 5 is 24, plus 4 is 28. Adds up to 28. Uh, away wins. So the grey bars added together. So that is 6 plus 5 plus 4 plus 6 plus 1. What does that add up to? Uh, 6 plus 5 is 11, plus 4 is 15, plus 6 is 21, plus 1 is 22. So how many more home wins than away wins? It's going to be 28 subtract 22 then, isn't it? So 28 subtract 22 is 6. So the answer is 6 more. Question 9a. Solve x plus 12 is equal to 29. Okay. Uh, when you have an equation, just do the same thing to both sides and you can't go wrong. Uh, so if I've got x plus 12 is equal to 29 and I subtract 12 from both sides, I should get x by itself. So x plus 12 take away 12 just leaves me with x and 29 take away 12 is 17. x is equal to 17. Uh, solve 0.5y is equal to 20. Now again, if you do the same thing to both sides, all is fine. So if I've got half, 0 0.5 is half y, isn't it? So half y, how can I get a whole y from half y? I can do that by multiplying it by 2. So if I do that to one side, I've got to do it to the other side as well. So 2 lots of 0 0.5 y is going to give me y. And 2 lots of 20 is going to give me 40. So y is 40. Question 10. Boxes cost £2.40 each. You can use this table to work out the cost of different number of boxes. Okay, so we can see that one box costs £2.40, two boxes cost £4.80, five boxes cost £12, and ten boxes cost £24. 
Work out the cost, cost of three boxes. Now, I could work out three times 2.4. I can do it as an addition. If I know this is two and this is one, then if I add them together, I'm going to get three, aren't I? So if I do the same thing with the costs, £4.80 plus £2.40, it's going to be slightly quicker than multiplying by three. So zeros, uh, eight, four is 12, carry one, five, seven, seven pounds and 20 pence. Ethan pays 52 pounds 80 for some of these boxes. Work out the number of boxes he buys. Okay, 52 pounds 80. So, uh, again, can we use the table to help us? Uh, so 52 pounds 80 we're trying to get to. 52 pounds 80. Now, if I use that one twice, that's going to give me 48 pounds, isn't it? And then that leaves another four pounds eighty to use. If I use two of those, oh look, and then I've got one of those and it would finish it off then. Because two twenty fours are forty eight and another four pounds eighty is gonna give me fifty two eighty. So that's two lots of ten, twenty boxes and two boxes, which makes twenty two boxes. Twenty two. Uh, finally, it says use the table to write the ratio nine pounds sixty to twelve pounds as a ratio in its lowest in its simplest form. How can I use the table to do that then? So nine pounds sixty to twelve pounds. Okay. Well, nine pounds sixty is two lots of four pounds eighty, so that would be four boxes, and twelve pounds is five boxes, so. It's four boxes to five boxes, so that is actually the ratio in its simplest form, isn't it? Four to five. Question 11. How many degrees does the hour hand on a clock turn in nine hours? Circle your answer. Uh, now, remember that in a exam, you've always got a clock on the wall, so you can use that as a visual aid to help you. Uh, so 12 o'clock is at the top. So if that little hand is on uh, 12... And nine hours later, it turns around and it's now pointing to the nine. Then it's gone that far, isn't it? Three quarters of a turn or three lots of 90 degrees, which is 270 degrees. It's going to be that one there. Question 12. What fraction of one quarter is one eighth? That's a quite odd, oddly worded question. What fraction of one quarter is one eighth? Basically, what you're asking is how many times does one eighth fit into one and one quarter? In other words, what is one and one quarter divided by one eighth? Okay, uh, right. So when we're dividing fractions, first off, it's best to write things as top heavy fractions rather than mixed numbers like this. So one and one quarter is the same thing as uh, five quarters, isn't it? One times four is four plus one is five. So that becomes five quarters. And dividing through by a fraction is the same as flipping it over and times in. So I can times it through by that instead, eight once. So five fourths times eight once. Uh, so you can either do top, top times top, bottom times bottom, or easier sometimes is to do the division first. 4 goes into 8 twice, so I can cancel that 4 into the 8. That gives me 5 times 2 is 10, 1 times 1 is 1, 10 over 1, which is 10. It goes in 10 times. Uh, so that's how you do it with fraction division. The other way you could do it is, well, you could say that uh, 2 eighths fit into a quarter, and so there are 5 quarters altogether, 1 and a quarter, so 5 times 2 is 10. Also works as well. Um, yeah, either way, it's going to be uh, a tenth, isn't it? Question 13. A point lies on the graph of the equation y equals x squared plus x. The x-coordinate of the point is minus 3. Circle the coordinates of the point. Well, the equation of a graph links its x-coordinate values to its y-coordinate values. So if I know the x-coordinate is minus 3, sorry, I can substitute that into the equation to find the y coordinate. So if x is minus 3, 
then x squared becomes minus 3 squared. And then I've got plus x, which is plus negative 3, like that. So I need to work out what that is. So negative 3 squared is negative 3 times negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Negative times negative is positive, positive, and then we're going to add on negative 3, which is the same thing as subtracting 3. 9 subtract 3 is 6, so that means when x is minus 3, then y is going to be 6. It's that coordinate. Question 14. Is 30 times 445 greater than 15 times 900? Give a reason for your answer. Well, you could work them both out, I suppose. You could do some, just do some long multiplication and work out the answers, compare them. But you can also see that uh, 30 is twice as big as 15. Uh, and 445, though, is not half of 900. Uh, it's less than half of 900. So that would indicate to me that 15 times 900 is going to be bigger than uh, 30 times 445. So I'm going to say the answer is no. Uh, give a reason for your answer. Am I going to write that down then? That 30 is twice 15, but 445 is a less than half of 900. Question 15. Rearrange P equals R plus 3 to make R the subject. Okay, now rearranging equations works exactly the same way as solving linear equations. You've just got to do the same thing to both sides uh, to isolate the thing that you want to find. So if I want to make R the subject, I want to, I want to get this by itself. And I can do that by subtracting 3 from both sides. Uh, if I subtract 3 from the right-hand side, r plus 3 take away 3 is just going to leave me with the r. And on the left-hand side, I'm going to get p minus 3 is equal to r. So just spinning that round the other way, so r equals p minus 3, you can see it's going to be that one there. Question 16a, work out 1 quarter plus 7 tenths and give your answer as a fraction. So we've got some fraction addition here. So add in fractions, you can only do if the denominators are the same. And here, the denominators are different. I've got a 4 and a 10. So adding these up, I need to find first a common denominator that I can turn these both into. Okay, so what numbers does 4 and 10 both go into? You can always find a denominator by multiplying these two together. So 4 times 10 is 40, but there's often smaller ones. And actually, the smallest number that 4 and 10 both go into is 20. So I'm going to make mine fractions over 20, and then I can add them up. So first off, let's take this fraction on the left, 1 quarter. Uh, how many times does 4 go into 20? Well, 4 times 5 is 20. So if I multiply the bottom by 4, I've got to multiply the top by 4 as well. So 1 times 5 is 5, so 1 quarter is the same thing as 5 twentieths. So that's that one. Uh, now, let's have a look at the second one, 7 tenths. Uh, how many times does 10 go into 20? 10 goes into 20 twice. So times that by 2, times that by 2. Uh, it's going to give me 14 twentieths. So that was my second fraction there, the green one. Uh, and now I need to add them together. Okay, now when denominators are the same, it's very easy to add fractions together. The denominator stays exactly as it is, and we just simply add the numerators together. So 5 plus 14 is 19. So the answer is going to be 19 over 20. Next we've got some fraction multiplication. Uh, I've got three, ti three fifths times seven over two. There's no common factors top and bottom, so I'm just going to multiply top with top, bottom with bottom. Uh, three times seven is 21, and five times two is 10. Now, that's what we call a improper or top-heavy fraction. Here it says, though, give your answer as a mixed number. 
so I need to then rearrange this and think about how many tens fit into 21. 10 goes into 21 twice, remainder 1. So it's 2 and 1 tenths is our final answer. Question 17. A shopkeeper uses this formula to work out the cost of bags of oranges. C equals 1.8N, where C is the cost in pounds and N is the number of bags. Work out the cost of seven bags. So, uh, if I'm working out the cost of seven bags, remember that N was the number of bags, so N is equal to seven. So if N is equal to seven, then C is going to be 1.8 lots of N which is seven. There's a sub in that seven in. I can see I've got to multiply one by eight times seven. Okay, so what is 1.8 times seven? 1.8 times seven. Eight times seven is 56. Uh, so, uh, and then 177 plus five is uh, 12, isn't it? So that's one, two, six, one decimal point uh, one number behind a decimal point, so one number behind a decimal point, my answer is going to be 12.6. Now, I notice that they want the answer in pounds. So when you give answers in pounds, you always need to give it in pounds and pence. So just write as 12.6 here, you may lose a, an accuracy mark. So it's actually 12 pounds and 60 pence. Uh, 17B says, there are four oranges in each bag. Work out the average cost of an orange. Give your answer in pence. Okay, so what is the cost of one bag? The cost of one bag is going to be when n is 1, isn't it? So when n is 1, the cost is going to be 1.8 lots of 1, which is just 1.8, or 1 pounds 80, isn't it? 1 pound 80, I could write that down here. So then I need to divide that by 4. So 4's into 1.80. 4's into 1 don't go. Uh, fours into 18. How many times it go in? So that means it goes in four times and the remainder is two. Fours into 20 go five times, don't they? So that tells me that one orange then is 0 0.45 pounds, which is the same thing as 45 pence. Question 18. A straight line passes through the points minus 1, 2 and 1, 6. Another straight line has equation y is equal to x. Work out the coordinates of the points of intersection of the two lines. You, can be, you may use the grid to help you. Okay, so we need to draw a line then uh, through the points minus 1, 2 and 1, 6. Let's mark those on first. Minus 1, 2 is here. Uh, and then the second point was 1, 6. 1, 6, it's up here. So we need to draw a line through those two points. So I get my ruler out, lining them up between those two points, and drawing my line. Okay, so then I need to plot the line y is equal to x. Now y equals x means the y coordinates are equal to the x coordinate, so that is going to go through. 1, 1, 2, 2, 3, 3, and so on. Okay, so it's that line at 45 degrees angles. You should just remember what that one is. It comes up a lot. Uh, okay, so let's just oops, get my angle and my ruler correctly. Okay, now it looks like I didn't write, draw my first line quite long enough there. So you can see that they intersect at this point here then. That's the point of intersection there. So if I read the coordinates off along the corridor up the stairs, so that is minus four, minus four then, isn't it, as those coordinates? Minus four, minus four. Minus four, minus four. Question 19. Ajit is a barber. He charges five pounds for a haircut and he charges 10% extra for hair gel. One day, 52 customers have a haircut. 16 of these ask for hair gel. Work out the total amount that Ajit charges for his customers that day. Okay, so he's charging five pounds, 
for each of those 52 customers, isn't he? So if we work out 5 times 52, so 52 customers and five pounds each. Uh, multiplying by five, I just kind of use the fact that five is half of 10. So I can multiply it through by 10 and halve it, and that gives me the answer, or halve it and multiply it through by 10 is even easier. So half of 52 is 26, and times by 10 is 260. Okay, so he's gonna get 260 pounds for all the haircuts. Now he's gonna be charging 10% extra for hair gel. So what is 10% of five pounds? So 10% of five pounds, now that is 0 0.1 times five, isn't it? A tenth of five, which is 50p. And he's got 16 people asking for hair gel. So 16 times 50p is, it's gonna be eight pounds, isn't it? Okay, so £260 uh, for the haircuts, £8 for the gel gives you a total of 260 plus 8. So total money coming in, 260 plus 8, which is £268. Answer, 268 squids. Question 20. By rounding each number to one significant figure, estimate the, the answer to 78 times 11.6 divided by 391. You must show your workings. Okay, so rounding to one significant figure. The, the first significant figure is the first non-zero number of your, of your uh, number that you're looking at. So in 78, the, the first significant figure is the 7, which is in the tens column. So basically what you're being asked to do is round that number to the nearest 10. Okay, so 78 to the nearest 10 is going to be 80. 11.6, uh, again, the first significant figure is the first non-zero digit, which is the one. And again, that's in the tens column. So again, we're gonna be rounding that number to the nearest 10. So we're going to be, uh, well, 11.6. Which one's it, which 10 is it nearest? It's nearest 10, isn't it? So 80 times 10, divide by 391. Now the first significant figure of that number is that three there. That's in the hundreds column. So 391, we're gonna be rounding to the nearest 100. So 391 to the nearest 100 is 400. So I've got 80 times 10 divided by 400. Uh, so 80 times 10 is 800. 800 divided by 400. Well, 400 goes into 800 twice, doesn't it? So it's roughly two. So two. Solve x over three minus nine is equal to 12. Okay, let's start with this. Moving that over the equal side. Change sides, change signs. It's gonna, it's gonna give me x over 3 is equal to 12 plus 9. Why did I write 19? 12 plus 9. And 12 plus 9 is 21. So x over 3 is equal to 21. And then cross multiplying this 3 up here. I'm going to get x is equal to 63. Question 22. At a lucky dip stall, players pick a ball at random from a tub and then replace it. And on the tub it says, pick a green ball and win a prize. Now the, cup, the tub contains 250 red balls, 230 yellow balls, and 120 green balls. Emma has 15 picks. So what is the probability that Emma wins a prize with her first pick? Okay, so what is the probability then of picking basically a green ball? So we know, or we talked about earlier, the fact that probability is equal to successful outcomes divided by total outcomes. So when we're picking a ball from this tub of balls, uh, the total outcomes is the total number of balls that are in the, in the, in the tub, which is going to be the sum of those, isn't it? So 250 plus 230 plus zero. So five, three, and two adds up to zero as well. Okay. One, two, two, and one, and one makes six. So there are 600 balls altogether. So total outcomes is 600. Uh, success in this game is picking a green ball. So how many green balls are there? We're, there are 120, it tells us in the question. 
So the probability that she wins a prize with her first pick is going to be 120 out of 600. Okay, uh, you can cancel that down, but there's no need to with probability questions. They never give you any marks for it. And the only thing you can do is accidentally cancel it down incorrectly and lose marks. So leave it as it is. It's my advice. Uh, 22B, with her 15 picks, Emma wins four prizes. Is this more than the expected number? You must show your working. Okay, uh, well, when you have a competition like this, we're talking about relative frequency. And with relative fre frequency, we say that the expected successes... Can't spell successes. Let me try that again. Expect, expected successes is equal to uh, number of trials times um, relative frequency or probability of success. Okay, so number of trials then is the number of times that she picks from the from the tub, which is fifteen. And the relative frequency then is our probability that we worked out 120 over 600. Okay, so 15 times 120 over 600. So what's that then? Uh, 10 120s is 1,200. And 520s is 600. So 1,200 and 600 makes 1,000. 800 so that's 1800 over 600 uh if you're not quite sure how i did that you could always always do it like by long multiplication if you wanted to uh 600s into 1800 go in three times don't they just cancel those with those and we're looking at sixes into 100 uh, into 18s so it goes in three times. So we're expecting her to win three prizes then. That's the expected number of successes. Uh, now she actually picked out four prizes. So she's more lucky than we would expect. So is this more lucky than the expected numbers? Yes. Uh, yes. More. Okay, so we've got our work in, it's three, and we said that yes, it's more. So we've done everything we need to do. The air pressure in a tyre measures 7.2 bar. Air is leaking out at the rate of 0.2 bar per day. Part A asks, assume that the air continues to leak at the same rate. After how many days will the pressure measure 4.8 bar? Okay, well, the pressure drop is going to be the difference between those two numbers. So the pressure drop is going to be 7.2 subtract 4.8, which is, what's that, 2.4. And then we're going to see how many days that takes then by dividing 2.4 by uh, 0.2. So number of days is going to be that 2.4 divided by 0.2. So how many point twos go into 2.4? Uh, you can make division involving decimals easier if you multiply both parts through by the same power of 10. So 2.4 divided by 0.2 is the same thing as 24 divided by 2. And that is 12. So it takes 12 days. In part B, we're told that the rate that the air leaks out is actually increasing each day. And we're asked to work out how this is going to affect our answer. So going back and looking at our calculation, here we were dividing through by 0 0.2, which was the rate of air leakage. Now, if that's increasing over time, then we're going to be dividing through by a larger number, which means we're going to get a smaller answer. So it's going to mean that our answer here is going to be larger than it should be. So how does it affect our answer? it would take less than 12 days. The diagram shows three routes A, B and C between two towns X and Y. 
the distance and average speed for each route is shown. So we've got three different routes from X to Y. All have got different uh, distances and different speeds. So which of the three routes takes the longest amount of time? Assume average speed given. You must show your method. Okay, so let's work these out then. So you should remember the relationship between distance, speed, and time. I tend to remember them as a DST triangle like that, so I can cover up one bit to work out the others. So covering up the T in the triangle shows me that time is equal to distance divided by speed. So I can now work out time taken for each of these. So time equals distance, 25 divided by speed, 50, 25 divided by 50 is a half. So that's 0 0.5 and the units is gonna be hours because I've got miles and miles per hour. Uh, for route B, time taken is going to be the distance traveled, which is 20 divided by the speed, which is 30, which is two thirds of an hour, two thirds of an hour, 40 minutes. I suppose this one I could write as 30 minutes might be easier to compare that way and then route C 30 miles at 40 miles an hour then time taken is going to be my distance divided by my speed which is three quarters and three quarters of an hour is 45 minutes. So which one took the longest time is going to be route A. Again, it's not essential that you show your method in this space here. And sometimes it's easier to do the work on the diagram. However, I've been a bit naughty here and gone over the the edges so I should probably write that answer there because they scan these in these days so if you do write over the edge the examiner is not going to see it okay so you can write on the diagram like that but don't go over the lines so the answer is root C part B says John and Matt take the same time to travel from X to Y John travels along route B at 10 miles an hour faster than the average speed and Matt travels along route C. Does Matt travel faster or slower than the average speed for route C and by how much? You must show your working. Okay, so John's going down route B at 10 miles an hour faster than he should be or uh, than as on average. So he's going to be... So John's going this way, isn't he? This is John's route. And he's going to be going at 40 miles per hour because he's going to go 10 miles an hour faster. So he's doing 20 miles at 40 miles per hour. And we know that Matt is going along route C and we want to know whether or not he's going faster or slower. So Matt is going this way. Okay, so if we work out how, how fast it takes John we can then work backwards and work out how fast Matt was going. Okay, so let's do that. So John is going at 20, 20 miles at 40 miles an hour. So John, time taken is gonna be distance again divided by speed which in this case was 20 over 40, so it's going to take him 0.5 hours. Okay, so let's then work backwards because we don't know how fast Matt is going, but we do know he's, he's traveling for 30 miles. So then Matt, then speed, is going to be distance divided by time. So the distance was 30 
and the time is going to be the same as John's as they arrive at the same time so it's going to be 0 0.5 which means he's got to be traveling at 60 miles per hour so the route speed average was 40 miles an hour so he's going significantly faster than that so Matt is going faster by 20 miles per hour. Here are the fourth and fifth terms of a Fibonacci sequence. So we've got 28 and 43 given. Now it's reminding us here that each term is the sum of the previous two terms. I should have known that already. Uh, and show that the first, two, uh, the first term is 2. Okay, so... Normally what you do with a Fibonacci sequence is that you take these two numbers here, you add them together, and it gives you the next one along. So something plus 28 equals 43. So we can work backwards through a Fibonacci sequence by subtracting uh, two consecutive numbers to, uh, from each other, and it will tell us the number that precedes them. So that number there is going to be 43 subtract 28, which is 15. So... That's 15 there, and we can do the same again. 28 subtract 15 is going to give me the next number along, which is 13, and then 15 subtract 13 is 2. So that's our first term there. Here are the first and third terms of a different Fibonacci type sequence. Each term is the sum of the previous two terms and work out an expression of A and B for the fifth term. Okay. So as we said earlier, normally what we would do is we would take whatever is in here and we'd add it with the A and that would give us the value of B. So the thing, the second term of this sequence is going to be the difference between A and B, which is well, it's basically B minus A, isn't it? So that term there is B minus A. Uh, and then, so that's the second term. Second term is B minus A. So we know the third term. Now the fourth term is going to be B minus A plus B. B minus A plus B, which is 2B minus A. And then... So that's 2b minus a there. And so the fifth term is going to be b plus 2b minus a, which is 3b minus a. So our answer is 3b minus a. a, b, d, e is a parallelogram. a, b is equal to a, c. Uh, let's show that x is equal to 22. Okay, now first let's add this extra information to the diagram because it doesn't, it isn't already all there. If A, B, D, E is a parallelogram, then this side and this side are parallel, and this side and this side are parallel. Also, we're told that A, B equals A, C, so this length is equal to this length, which means this angle is equal to this angle. Okay, so how does that help us? Um, well, first off, we know because it is a parallelogram that this angle here and this angle here must be equal. So this angle down here must be 65 degrees as well. Uh, and because it is an isosceles triangle, this must be 65 which means the angle at the top here is going to be 180 minus 2 lots of 65. 180 minus 2 lots of 65. 2 lots of 65 is 130. Take away from 180 is 50. So that angle there is 50. Uh, right, what else do we know? Now using the properties of parallel lines, we can say that this angle here, the 72, is alternate to the combination of these two angles up here. So 50 and x make 72, so we can see that x is 22. 
So x equals 72 subtract 50, which is 22 degrees. Now there's lots of space of writing down here, but unless it's a, a prove that question, um, I would say it's just as easy to work out your, or you do your workings on the diagram rather than writing it down here. Uh, it's a bit different if it does say prove that because you have to actually state the reasons why things are what they are. Noah is attempting to work out the base of different right angle triangles. Here is his method for working out y is equal to 10 and x is equal to 6. So he first works out y squared, uh, in this example is 100, then he works out x squared, in this case it's 36, then he subtracts one from the other, and then he square roots them. This is basically Pythagoras theorem, isn't it? Uh, so underneath it says, tick the, the correct statement. The method is will always give you an answer, which is a whole number. The method will sometimes give an answer, which is a whole number. The method will never give an answer, which is a whole number. Well, his first example here, with x and y equals 10 and 6, gave us root 64, and root 64 is 8, so that is a whole number. So that particular example does give a whole number for the base, but if you've ever done any questions with Pythagoras theorem before, you'll know that that is a rarity. Uh, the Pythagorean triples are the ones that give you nice whole numbers, otherwise uh, they are decimals. Now, it asks here that we need to show our working or, or show working to support our answer. So we need to give some examples of, of why we'd, we would pick this one. This is obviously um, the correct solution that, that sometimes gives, gives us a whole number. But let's give some examples. Uh, so when so when y is 10 and x was 6, we had a triangle that looked like this. 10, 6, and so our base then was going to be root 64, which is 8. But when y, well then we just change one of the values, I suppose. So let's change y to uh, 8 and leave x equal to 6. Then the base is going to be equal to square root of, uh, the square of 8 is 64. So tra subtract the square root of 6, which is 36 square rooted. 64 subtract 36 is 28, uh, and that is a decimal. And that is a whole number. So just giving an example of where it does happen and where it doesn't happen is enough supporting method to highlight that middle statement there. AC is a diagonal of a chi A, B, C, D. A is the point 1, 5 and C is the point 3, 1. Now the diagonals of the chi intersect at M, the midpoint of AC. Okay, so that's our point M in the middle at 2, 3. Now, if you know anything about kites, you should probably know that their diagonals intersect at right angles. So we're going to have the points, the other two points of this kite lying somewhere along this line here. I'm just going to draw this in as a guideline. So let's do that in a different color. So you see that's at right angles. So our points, our other two points of the kite are going to lie somewhere on this line. And we're going to have to put them down in such a way as the ratio of B to M and M to D is in the ratio of 1 to 2. In other words, the distance from M, which is our midpoint, to the point B is half the distance from the midpoint to the point D. So let's say 
Well, let's make B this point here. So you'll notice that that's kind of two squares along and one square up from the midpoint. So that's going to be the tip of our kite. So the other end of the kite is going to be twice as far away. So rather than being there, which would be equidistant, it's going to be another one along. So it's going to be two down and four along from that midpoint there. So once I've decided where the points are, so that's going to be point D. I can now join them up to form my kite. So work out possible coordinates of B and D. Uh, B is the coordinate 4, 4. And D is the coordinate minus 2, 1. Now there are actually lots of different possible kites that you could draw. Uh, you could have B further up the line and D further down the line or the other way around. Uh, but that is one solution and that's all we, re all we required. Well, that's the end of the paper. Not too bad, I hope. Let me know how you did in the comments and if you have any unanswered questions, why not ask them below? If you didn't do so well, time to hit the books a bit more and then come back and try another past paper in a few days. I'll be here to help you through that one too. And if you haven't already done so, why not subscribe so you can find me again for the next practice paper. Work hard, keep trying your best, and you will make progress. See you again next time.